Hey Aaron, uh, welcome to DTC seminar. And uh, today actually we have Barbara Sherling Pressure. <laughs> uh, she is DTC visitor, and uh, but uh, her background is um, amazing. Actually, she got three masters in education, actually astronomy and physics, and she is PhD actually in natural science in 2010 from. Oh, from Simi University, University of Greasy, right? Grass. Grass. In Austria. <laughs> Austria. Austria. Actually, uh, she, she was an ASP poster here for one year. So she's familiar with lots of us. And uh, she has uh, lots of experience with different institutes. And uh, now she's a scientist in Central Institute for Meteorology and uh, Geology. Dynamics. She will tell us what's that about, right? <laughs> there. <laughs> okay, welcome to the Barbara, and she will give us a seminar about uh, towards a better understanding of the vertical aerosol distribution in the atmosphere. Thank you. So, thank you, Ming. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. I don't know. It's Yes, okay. So, um, hello, I'm very happy to be here to give the seminar talk um, about my, my DTC, Visiting Scientist Project, um, which is about improving the, uh, in the, in, uh, the understanding and the knowledge about the vertical um, aerosol distribution in the atmosphere. Um, I'm originally from the Zentralanstalt für Metrologie und Geodynamik, that's the German um, official German word, and we're asked not to use the English translation, but the English translation is, as Ming just said before, um, the Central Institute for um, 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 Metrology and Geodynamics. Yeah, so you, you can read it on this side. So if you see a template like that, um, so everybody who works at the Austrian Met Service, this is what the Zentralanstalt für Metrologie und Geodynamik is about, you see this really nice cloud, and this is not an arbitrary cloud, but this is in the shape of Austria. So I just want to let you know that this is, this is a very special cloud, so this is how Austria looks like. I would like to start with some 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 motivation. So Ming told you that I received my PhD in 2010. Actually, it was in May 2010, and I submitted my thesis and didn't know what to do. So that's why I went to Lisbon together with my husband, boyfriend at that time. So we visited Portugal, went to Lisbon, and had a really very, very nice week in April 2010. I think we arrived on something like April 12th or, or 13th or so, went around, did a lot of sightseeing, looked at these really nice hills of Lisbon, a lot of old buildings and things like that. And we didn't have any, so during this week, we never had a look at the internet, we never had a look at our phones, we just enjoyed life and did some sightseeing. We had an amazing time in Lisbon. And on one particular day, we were a bit confused because we saw so many lines in front of travel agencies. So this is not one of the pictures we took because we didn't understand what's going on. We didn't see a reason why we should, should take a picture of a lot of people standing in front um, of some travel agency. So this picture is actually from, from somewhere from Norway, from Bergen or so. But we were somehow boring a bit. Maybe we should have a look at the TV or so, switch it on. I don't know. We were talking about it and then finally we decided, okay, let's have a look what's going on. And what we learned was that there was the eruption of the Eyjafjallajökull um, volcano on April 14th. So we found about that this eruption was going on on April 17th. So three days later of the eruption, we, we didn't think, we didn't know anything about it. So, but the news told us that there was increasing volcanic activity. It started erupting on April 14th. It already was um, April 17th. So we learned that there is a major disruption um, of the air traffic and that the ash was transported from Iceland towards continental Europe. So 
we were supposed to leave Lisbon on April 18th. So we were a bit concerned about how shall we go back to Austria because I told you I had my PhD defense in May. Oh, still some time to go. So we had a look at the map. Um, how long does it take us from Lisbon to, to Graz? Um, just with public transport, no airplanes. So if you use all the different options, bus, train, whatever. So I just took this screen a couple of days earlier. So this was not the situation how it was back in 2010. But the time frame was similar. So as far as I remember, we were told that it will take us 42 hours. That's more or less the same time frame. So, so, and it was already so the day just before we wanted to leave. So you see the distances. You do not feel these distances if you are there because if you you could just go on the plane and and go back home a couple of hours later you are there. But if you have to go there on ground based transportation, you see how how far these differences really are. So I think we if we had taken the train and the bus, I think we had to change it twelve times or so. So couldn't sleep during day, couldn't, couldn't sleep during night because we also have always had to change the system of public transportation. Um, actually, we were glad and we didn't take the bus and the train, but that's, that's another story. So we were look, looking at how, how was the, the situation of the um, air traffic. This map is taken from April 16th and you see hardly any flights up there. So that's around noon. You see some, some planes going in here um, in Portugal. You see some planes here in Italy and something going on um, in Eastern Europe. But besides that, this map is just empty. So no tra air traffic at all. How did it look like on the next day? Similar. How did it look like on April 18th? A little bit better. So some, um, some more flights at least. So in the eastern part of Europe, still a little bit more going on um, in Italy. And there are also some flights in, in Scandinavia, so in Norway and Sweden. April 19th. This is still not the way it should look like. So you still see a lot of empty spots and compared to a regular time schedule, this is nothing compared to the way it, it, it is supposed to look like. Um, April 20 and April 21st. So still on April 21st, you see here in France a big hole. So there are no air, air traffic going on here. Um, in Spain, hardly any tra air traffic going on. Here is still some, some empty spots over here, but it's getting at least back, back to normal. So we, I just go back to April 18th, because this was the day when we really had the chance to go back to Germany. This um, figure is taking around noon and we landed in Munich around midnight or so. I think the pilot took this way to go th through back to Italy and then he drove up somewhere here um, to Munich. So we were really, really, really glad that the pilot wanted to have his, his airplane back in Munich. And this was the reason why we got onto the plane and came home at least only one day later because we had to wait for the train from Munich to Graz. So, but we were really, really glad to have the chance to go back um, to Austria almost in time. Um, so what was the, the, the really interesting thing about this eruption? The interesting thing is that this eruption was not really, really large. So for a volcanic eruption, it was pretty unspectacular. 
But the mountain was covered by water, and this water started to melt. And then it finally was a mixture of water vapor and ash. And a lot of very, very fine ash got into the atmosphere. And due to the atmospheric motion, all this fine ash was spread towards continental Europe. And it sta stayed really very, for a very, very long time um, in the atmosphere over Europe. More than 10,000 flights were canceled from April 15th to April 21st. So seven millions of people were affected. They couldn't uh, travel for the, one of them was, was, was me. Um, some agency estimated a huge loss um, for the airlines and it was the highest level of air traffic interruption um, since the Second World War. So it was not only the air industry and the, the airplanes that, that had this problem, it was, this really had a global impact because also people from, from the US, from Asia, so nobody could travel to Europe. Portugal was one of the countries which was hardly affected at all. So lots of airplanes flew to Portugal and to Lisbon and then continued their, their, um, their travel from Portugal. But as you saw before, Portugal is pretty far away from the rest of Europe, so it's really at the edge. Um, a nice, oh, interesting, it's not nice, it's just interesting. For example, it had an impact on Kenya because Kenya, they, they have a lot of vegetables, they had a lot of flowers, and this is one of their major incomes in economic. So, but 97% of all the flowers that grow in Kenya are transported to Europe. So they, and there was no way to get these flowers to Europe. So also huge economic loss for, 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 for industries you would not even think about, or at least I wouldn't think about. So what was the problem? The problem, of course, mainly was the volcanic eruption. So the volcanic eruption brought fine ash into the atmosphere and airplanes um, shouldn't fly through fine ash so, because of safety features. So there are lots of problems with the engines of airplanes if they fly through um, volcanic ash clouds. But it wasn't only this the problem. The other problem was also that nobody really knew where the ash was, how much ash there was at a particular place, the details about the aerosol concentration um, during this event. Um, there are volcanic ash advisory centers, and the volcanic ash advisory centers are the institution who tell the stakeholders where they could go, what they think that it is safe to fly through. But there are so many data coming in during such event, but these data cannot be used. So nobody is able to coordinate all these activities, and there is just a lot of issues with, with data availability and data distribution. Um, we have in Austria, um, we are leading the project UNEDX AV. Um, this project aims at um, providing fast, coherent, and consistent information about the aerosol distribution during natural hazard events, such as volcanic eruptions, such as strong sandstorms, such as wildfires, for example. So all these natural e events which it could affect um, aviation, so this AV at the very end stands for aviation. If you want know, to know more about this project, I, I put the link on, so just check the website and you will learn about this project. It's a really huge project. So there are 21 project partners. Um, ZAMC is the leading um, um, institute. Um, more than 12 countries are involved. A lot of national centers are involved. More than se 7 million um, euros in total. Unfortunately, it will end in, in fall next year. But it's a really nice project. So what is my, my DTC Visiting Scientist project about? I think I convinced you that it is important to have a better knowledge about the aerosol distribution. So um, if we had a better knowledge about the aerosol distribution at that time, um, the impact on aviation, for example, would have been less. And the problem is that 
All the observations are either surface-based observations or satellite-based observations. And the satellite-based observations measure mainly vertically integrated um, um, uh, measures. So there is limited information about the vertical aerosol distribution um, in the atmosphere, and that's why my aim is to implement the LIDAR data assimilation into the um, GSI 3D VAR to improve aerosol forecasts. Um, at, uh, at ZAMC, our, um, at, the, at the section I work at, at least, so which is the chemical, forca um, chem chemical weather forecast section, we use the WAFCHEM um, model. To, um, to model the aerosol distribution in the atmosphere, and we use the GSI system, the GSI 3D VAR, um, to get um, analysis out of um, out of the for so, so to, to to merge model and, and observational information, um, and that's why we would like to do it in the GSI framework and get lidar data assimilation um, into our model. So now this is. Not the only one, but one of the very few slides where I put on some some formulas because I think it is interesting. It is important to understand what what we try to do. So this is the LIDAR equation. You have four terms: k, g, beta, and t. So the p is mainly is is the signal which is received at uh, by the by the receiver. So LIDAR works the a way that there is a transmitter that um, that uh, puts a, a laser signal into the atmosphere. The signal is backscattered and it is received by a telescope. And the power of this signal received by the telescope is described by P, um, which depends on the distance to the particles where the backscattering comes from and the wavelength. The factor K describes the performance of the LIDAR system, um, which is a function of the signal originally transmitted um, by, the uh, by the receiver. It's a function of the, the length of the laser pulse. It's a function of um, 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 speed of light. It's also a function of the telescope area, so how, how big is the telescope, and the efficiency of the telescope. This Factor K only depends on the the, the the LIDAR instrument itself, so no physical modeling about it. So it's just the instrument itself. J is also uh, something which only depends on the LIDAR instrument, so you cannot model it, or of course you have to model it if you, if you do some retrieval stuff, but um, if you use... Um, retrieved quantities like level 1b or level 2 data, so you do not have to care about this factor j, because it also uh, depends on the geometry of the instrument. Then you have the backscattering coefficient, which depends again on the distance to the um, scattering cloud and the scattering volume, and it depends on, on wavelength. It depends on aerosol concentration n, it de depends on the um, cross section um, of the of the scattering and the physical properties of the scattering, and this is something which is important to be to be uh, modeled correctly. And the last term, the t, which is the transmission um, at distance t, this is also an important quantity. It depends um, on alpha. Alpha is the extinction coefficient. So higher, it, it, it tells you how much light is lost on the way to, to the scattering volume and also back from the scattering volume. So um, the things we would like to model are this beta, the backscattering coefficient, and the extinction coefficient or the, or the transmission. Um, if you combine these two factors, so the combination of beta and t, these two, um, is the attenuated backscatter signal. This is a, a level 1b parameter, and beta and t are both level 2 um, parameters, um, which we are going to, to model further on. 
So what kind of LiDAR measurements are around? Um, there are several ground-based LiDAR measurements and there are space-based LiDAR measurements. So ground-based me measurements like just individual LiDAR stations somewhere around. In the U there are plenty of LiDAR stations. Unfortunately, we do not have currently any LiDAR station in Austria. There is the plan to have one, but right now we don't have any. There are measurement campaigns to get a better knowledge about the vertical distribution of um, aerosols, and there are several LiDAR networks. One of the LiDAR networks I'm interested in is the Erlinet, which is the uh, European Aerosol Research LiDAR Network, um, which was established in 2000, currently 31 stations. You see a map where all these stations are. So lots of stations are in the southern part of Europe, so down there. The reason for that is that it's really important to model Saharan dust outbreaks. So Africa is just down here. And if you have a, a wind coming from the south towards the north, under certain conditions, it can happen that Saharan dust comes from the south and covers more or less all Europe. So it can also affect air, um, aviation industry. Just recently in March, I think, there was a pretty strong Saharan dust outbreak and there were several flights canceled here in, in southern Italy and also in Greece because just because of Saharan dust. So and that's the reason why several stations of the early net are located um, in the southern part of Europe. Um, Space-based space LiDAR measurements, so the probably most famous one um, is on the Calypso satellite, which was launched in 2000. Um, it ha only had a design lifetime of three years. So now it's 2018, it's already 12 years in orbit, which is a nice thing, I think. I don't know how long it will make it, but still, so 12 years in orbit is pretty good. It carries a two wavelength LIDAR, so it performs measurement at 532 nanometers and at 1064 um, nanometers. So these are currently the um, wavelengths we are most interested in. But just very recently, in August this year, the satellite um, ADM Aeolus has been launched. This is a European satellite, um, also in a sun synchronous orbit, also designed lifetime, so it's exactly the same three years. And it carries a single wavelength LIDAR, which performs measurement at 355 nanometers. A different, another difference beside the wavelength um, between the two is that Cal Calypso has a na nadir looking LIDAR. LiDAR um, instrument, and Adem Aeolus, um, the instrument Elada, is, is um, side-looking with 35 degrees of nadir. So if we model or would like to model this, this LiDAR, we have to account for the measurement geometry. So if you would like to do um, LiDAR data assimilation, it's not only part of the GSI system, but you have to model the physical properties of the atmosphere. So aerosol optical properties, such as um, backscattering coefficients and um, extinction coefficients. So the GSI itself does not do any um, radiative transfer modeling, but the, the model that is included in the GSI system is the community radiative transfer model, the CRTM, which is a fast radiative transfer model um, that simulates satellite-based radiances. Before we started doing that, it already could simulate um, aerosol optical depth as performed by, by Terra and Aqua satellites, also performed by the MODIS instrument, which is on board of, of, a Modi, um, of, of, of Aqua and Terra. And, and there is also another um, um, instrument on the VIRS satellite. CRTM currently only considers cocut aerosols, which means dust, sea salt, organic carbon, black carbon and sulfate. So these are the only aerosols that can currently be modeled um, using the CRTM. So what does the CRTM do? The CRTM mainly uses uh, 
an aerosol lookup table, which has all the information about aerosol properties um, of these go-cut variables. One of the things, um, or one of the, the, the information it contains, is the hygroscopic growth of, of, of aerosols, so of sea salt, organic carbon, black carbon, and sulfur. So it is not, or we assume that dust doesn't grow with humidity, so dust does not grow with increasing humidity. These two plots show the hygroscopic growth of aerosols left-hand side on a linear scale. The right plot shows exactly the same on a logarithmic scale. I just think it's nice to see it on a linear scale because you really see where it's getting, where things change um, very, very um, strong with, with, um, with humidity. But of course, you get much more information if you plot it, plot it on, a, on a logarithmic scale. There are several black uh, lines in different uh, widths. This is dust. So this is, for example, dust at 0.55 um, microns, 0.4 microns, 2.4 microns, 4.5 microns, and 8 microns. These are the sizes we model because this is what our go-cut model assumes about the size distribution of our dust aerosols. Um, these straight lines, this, for example, is hydrophobic, what is it, organic carbon, and the other one, this one with these nice dots in here, is um, hydrophilic um, organic carbon. So you see that sea salt strongly increases, so the size of sea salt aerosol strongly increases with um, increasing humidity. Um, carbon and sulfur, so black carbon and, and organic carbon and also sulfur, the, the size of these aerosols is much, much smaller compared to, to sea salt aerosols. This is one of the things you, you learn if you look at COTM um, lookup table. Another thing you look you learn is how the mass extinction coefficient um, look like for different kinds of humidity. So mass extinction coefficients depend on the aerosol type, I. I always abbreviate aerosol type with I here. The aerosol size with its, this size depends on humidity, so you have to keep it in mind, and lambda is wavelength. So I plotted a uh, mass extinction coefficient as a function of wavelength for 10% humidity and 90% humidity. If you just look at the 90% humidity plot and focus on the lines without any dots, these are the hydrophobic quantities. So this one, hydrophobic organic carbon. So this is the same as this here. And you see the change pretty easily if you just compare the solid line with the solid line with the dead dots on it. So for example, you see that organic carbon with increasing humidity, um, the mass extinction coefficient strongly increases as well. Um, we are looking at, or I am focusing, I would say maybe that way, on four wavelengths, which is 355 nanometers, feet, uh, 532, it's easier to be seen here, 550 and 1064 because um, 355, 532 and 1064 are the, the wavelengths of the LIDAR instruments and 550 is the wavelength where we always look at AOD as performed by, by MODIS or VIRS um, instruments. Um, what about information of the single scatter albedo? So single scatter albedo is a quantity that describes um, the ratio between um, scattering and extinction. So it's the scattering uh, coefficient divided by the extinction coefficient. The extinction coefficient itself um, contains about information about scattering and absorption. So if it's a purely scattering medium, the single scattering albedo is equals to one. If it's a purely absorbing medium, and this beta s equals to zero because it's only absorbing, the single scattering albedo is zero. And this is how single scattering albedo depends on wavelength. Again, for 10% humidity and for 90% humidity, the meaning of the colors is exactly the same. Also, the meaning of these black 
solid color uh, lines, which which was dust for different um, dust radii. So big dust aerosols in heavy, thick black lines, small dust aerosols with these small, um, thin black lines. And again, we are interested in these aerosol wavelengths. So um, single scattering albedo for sulfur, for example. So sulfur seems to be, or obviously is, a purely scattering um, 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 aerosol because it is it equals to zero, or it is equal to zero here over all the wavelengths we are interested in. Um, just one more comment about the wavelengths. So the wavelengths of the CRTM cover the range from 200 microns to pff, something over there, 30,000 or so, I think it was, 32,000 microns, which is important because it also contains or it already contains some information about the UV. So we thought that the, we don't have any information about UV and the 355 lighters, we might not be able to model this quantity, but that's not true. So there is already some information in because um, the information starts at 200 um, microns a wavelength. What else do we get out of it? So um, the aerosol phase function. So the aerosol phase function itself is not part of the CRTM lookup table. You have to reconstruct the aerosol phase function using this Clenshaw recursion. That's important to know. Um, and since we are, may, we are particularly interested in the backscattering part, we are not interested in the forward scattering or sideward scattering, but in the backscattering part, which happens at 180 degrees. So if we just look at the scattering at 180 degrees and plot these dots here as a function of effective radius, this is what we get. Um, it's for dust, you have a minimum here around, what is it? Yeah, 10 by the minus of minus one. So very, very um, small aerosols. These aerosols here have a, a, um, a radius of one microns. We are mainly, so for the dust aerosols, we are mainly looking at this part here. So smallest dust aerosol we are currently looking at is um, 0.55 microns, which is here, uh, 1.4 microns is somewhere here. So and mainly we're looking at this part of the um, wave uh, of, the, of the dust aerosols, for example. And the, all the other aerosols depend on humidity. So we do not really know. It depends on humidity on which part um, of, of the phase function we are mainly interested in. Um, I told you that this was just the basic, what is contained in the CRTM and what do we want to get out of the CRTM to model the quantities we are actually interested in, which is AOD, for example, as I told you before, AOD, aerosol optical depth at 550 nanometers. So what is AOD? AOD can be obtained from multiplying the vertically integrated aerosol concentration of a layer multiplying this by the mass extinction coefficient. This is the optical depth of, the, of a layer which doesn't have any dimensions. So, and the total AOD, so the total column optical depth is obtained by summing over all aerosol layers and summing over all aerosol types. Um, this is what AOD is. Volume extinction coefficient is very, very similar to AOD. The general relationship between optical depth and the um, extinction coefficient is that optical depth is extinction coefficient and then the, it's just the thickness of the layer. So to get volume extinction coefficient out of the optical depth, you have to, to divide it by the um, depth of the layer. These are the really easy things. And then it's the volume backscatter coefficient, which is the vertically integrated aerosol concentration of the layer. 
It is the mass extinction coefficient, which depends on aerosol type, of course, the size of the aerosol and wavelength. The single scattering albedo, so remember this was the quantity, um, the, the ratio between scattering and extinction, so how much light is scattered relative to how much light is, is, is just um, ex yeah, vanishes at all. And then we have these two blue terms, the P, which is the aerosol phase function at 180 degrees. This is what this pi is about, divided by 4 pi. Yeah? And then we also have to divide this quantity by the layer depth. So to model volume backscattering um, coefficient, we have to have this um, aerosol phase function at 180 degrees, the one I just showed you earlier. We have to have knowledge about single scattering albedo, which is part of the aerosol table. The mass extinction coefficient is part of the aerosol table. The vertically integrated aerosol concentration of the layer is part of the model output. So knowing all these quantities, we can model the volume backscattering coefficient B. Um, there is also an interesting quantity, which is the LIDAR ratio, which is also called extinction to backscatter ratio. So extinction divided by backscatter. Um, if you remember that extinction was mainly this red term, so vertically integrated aerosol concentration times the mass extinction coefficient. So this term just cancels out by, by this extinction um, coefficient. So the remaining parts and also the d set, so because it's, it's a quantity per unit length, you have this factor, the 4 pi, you have the single scattering albedo, you have the aerosol phase function at 180 degrees. So this is the LIDAR ratio. And because of this um, connection and all these quantities, it clearly depends on the aerosol type, it depends on aerosol shape, it depends on the refractive index. Um, but it's a highly variable quantity, but on average you can assume that it is constant for different aerosol types. It's a strong approximation, it's not the truth, but if you look over a lot of aerosol, this is what you get on average. So you can assume these values for the um, LIDAR ratio, and if you assume a constant LIDAR ratio, and you already calculated the um, extinction coefficient, you can have an approximation for the volume backscattering coefficient. So we currently have two ways to get an idea about the volume backscattering coefficient, either using the, um, the phase function, the aerosol phase function at 180 degrees, which has its weaknesses also, or we assume a constant LIDAR ratio and just knowing the extinction coefficient, which is much easier to model because it only depends on the mass extinction coefficient. Um, dividing it by the constant LIDAR ratio and then we have an approximation of the um, volume backscattering coefficient. So and that's what we did. So we did these, we calculated extinction coefficient, AOD and backscattering coefficients using different methods. But of course we would like to know how close we come to the truth, which is challenging and it takes some time and you learn a lot and we started at huge differences relative to MERA. So what we actually did was using MERA data. So this is a modern era retrospective analysis for research and application and it doesn't only contain um, thermodynamic variables, but also information about um, aerosols. So there are aerosol fields, fields of aerosol concentrations. You get AOD information, you get LIDAR um, volume um, extinction and volume backscattering coefficients at exactly the wavelengths we are interested in. So this is a great data set to compare it to and to validate our model. So we use data from April 17th, 2010. So this was still the, this was exactly the day where I learned about the EF yellow eruption. Um, 
some volcanic activity going on. We used both MERA era, era, so MERA 1 and MERA 2 data because so MERA, you shouldn't in general use MERA 1 data, but um, MERA 2 doesn't provide information about LIDAR aerosol optical uh, properties, so like extinction and, and um, at backscattering coefficients. That's why we also had to use MERA 1 data. We only used one global field. It has a horizontal resolution of 0.625 degrees in longitude and 0.5 degrees in latitude, 72 vertical layers. We used this, and they also use go-kart aerosols. This is also a very big advantage because we could just read the data, put it into the CRTM, and compare the output. And that's exactly what we did. We simulated AOD and the other aerosol optical um, properties and compared them, so comparison between CRTM and MERA. This is how AOD looks like. Um, AOD on April 17th, 2010, um, ranges more or less between zero and one. It doesn't have any dimension, this quantity. You see highly elevated values here over Africa, North Africa which is mainly related to dust aerosols. The same here in East Asia, also issues with dust. And what I think is really nice, you see a very small spot of high AOD values here in Europe. And this might be related to um, the volcanic eruption. And you also see high values over the oceans here, here, and here, for example, and these high AOD values are related to sea salt. So this is what you get if you use MERA input data and use the CRTM to calculate AOD. How does the difference between CRTM and MERA look like? So CRTM minus MERA, this means that positive values are obtained if CRTM has larger values then MERA negative values mean that MERA has higher AOD values compared to CRTM. And you see a clear pattern. So you clearly see what's going on. You have a lot of red spots over the oceans, which means CRTM AOD is higher than a MERA AOD. And you see nice blue regions here in Northern Africa, East Asia, the spots where we had the high um, AOD values because of dust. So, which is an indication that CRTM underestimates AOD in, in really dusty regions, um, which could be the case because, of, uh, because CRTM only considers spherical aerosols and not non-spherical aerosols and MERA does. Over the ocean, it seems that the, the difference between MERA and CRTM um, AOD over the oceans is mainly related to the hygroscopic growth of aerosols. And we think that CRTM um, models hygroscopic growth more realistically than, than MERA. But this, from this comparison plot, of course, you do not know which one is the truth, right? So it's only, it's only a difference between two models. That's why we used Aeronet data and compared Aeronet AOD um, to CRTM and MERA. The problem with Aeronet, of course, is that there are hardly any data over our dusty region here in North Africa. There is only one spot here, and this is only at the very edge of Africa, North Africa. There is some high AOD values here in East Asia. We can, can focus on them, and there is no or almost no data above, above the ocean. So getting a clear picture about the quality of CRTM and MERA and which one is closer to the truth is pretty hard using Aeronet data. Um, but nevertheless, we, we try to find out which is more reliable and this is what, what we get if we just plot AOD from Aeronet data on the x-axis and MERA and CRTM data AOD on the y-axis. The blue, blue dots are MERA, the red dots are CRTM. You see that MERA is at least closer to the Aeronet truth. 
um, has a bit uh, yeah, higher correlation um, than, than COTM. Um, and these values here are these values in the very East, East Asian region, in the very dusty region. But to come to a clear conclusion from this plot, so we only used one day of data. These are 97 stations. So you have to use more data to get a, a, a clearer <coughs> picture. But at least you get an impression that it's not completely nonsense what we do. Um, the next quantity we were looking at was um, volume extinction coefficient. This is how volume extinction coefficients look like as a function of pressure. So pressure on the y-axis, volume extinction coefficient on the x-axis. Um, I also pl I plotted individual profiles, not every profile, but I think... I think every hundredth profile or maybe every thousandth profile or so. So not every profile, just just a random number of profiles um, evenly distributed. So there are more than 10,000 grid points which, which went into the statistics. Um, I plotted the median in red, the mean in blue, and to get a better idea about the variability, the 75th percentile and the standard deviation. And what you clearly see already in this plot is that there are lots of outlayer profiles. So the difference between the median, the red line, and the mean, the blue line, can be pretty large in some, um, yeah, more or, less, more or less everywhere over the entire vertical domain. Um, you also see, now oh, we will see it on the next plot, because the next plot shows the difference between um, CRTM and MERA. And you clearly see that the median here increases below 700 hectopascal, for example. And I, I'm pretty sure that this is related to sea salt. Um, I didn't make a separate plot just for dusty regions and, and, and regions above the ocean, but I think this is something, some, this is some kind of plot where you will see if this strong increase is really mainly due to sea salt aerosols. Um, and here you see these very, very big outlayers and, and the standard deviation just goes s somewhere. This might be related, I think, at least to some MERA-1 data issues. If you look at the vertical profiles, there are invalid values in the middle of the profiles. So you have to vertically interpolate to, to get something reliable out of it. And you have to play a little bit around with the data. So. <clears throat> I'm not too much concerned about these outlayer profiles, but the, the median profile, the difference between CRTM and MERA is positive here below approximately 800 hectopascal, and it's negative all the way up. So about 10% is the difference, which is not, not too bad, I think. Um, what, how does it look like compared to a real measurement? So this is not only comparison between two models, but this no, now we would like to see how it looks like compared to some kind of measurements. We used um, data from the Calliope instrument. I focused on two orbits. One orbit here, this is a daytime orbit, and I only used these data, so do not look at this purple stuff or the black stuff. That's not interesting for our purpose. I only used data between the equator here and 30 degrees north, for this, so just North Atlantic region. And here, second one, these measurements during nighttime. Nighttime measurements are better than daytime measurements. And this is this part of the orbit, also between the equator and 30 degrees north. Um, and measurements just here in this region above North Africa. Um, you see the extinction coefficients from the Calliope measurements. So there are some regions where you do not get any data. Um, so the extinction in this plot is mainly caused by sea salt. The extinction in this plot here is mainly caused by dust. You see much higher values here, for example, in this region above North Africa where you have a huge dust load in the atmosphere. Um, the quality of, of the measurements above North, North Africa are also much better because, as I said before, these are nighttime measurements and the others are daytime measurements. 
So how do the differences between the measurements and the models look like? What I did is I interpolated the models to the measurement points, which is maybe, well, it's not the truth. The model has a completely different horizontal resolution, has a completely different vertical resolution. The only thing we would like to get out is, is it, is it reasonable what our model does or is it complete nonsense? And this is, it is good enough to do that. So you see, and, and you have to keep in mind that the aerosol concentrations which go into these plots are exactly the same for, for, for CRTM and MERA. So the main picture is the same, but you see, for example, a bit higher values here in MERA, which is in good agreement here with Calliope. So you see that MERA is closer to the truth um, than CRTM, and this is also exactly the same what you get out. If you just plot mean, the mean over this entire orbit between equator and 30 degrees, um, relative to, to um, Calliope measurements. So mean differences here, for example, in the dusty region of North Africa of um, MERA data are in pretty good ag agreement with, with the satellite measurements. Also, the median differences are, are, are pretty good agreement with, with um, the satellite measurements. And there is a small offset in CRTM in terms of extinction, maybe really because of the modeling of dust. Uh, we did the very same for um, backscattering coefficients, applying two methods using the constant LIDAR ratio for each aerosol type and using the phase function. You see, um, I have to admit, you have a different y, uh, x, x range for these two plots. But still, if you keep in mind that the spread is different, nevertheless, you see a lot of outlayer profiles here in this in this approach, when you look at the um, constant LIDAR ratio and the differences are often larger than 100%, you do not see so much outlayer profiles here, but everything is shifted, right? So to be fair, I have to plot it on the, on the same X range. Um, a constant offset in the median here um, of, of CRTM, better agreement here if you use the constant LIDAR ratio because this is zero difference, and here you have a difference of about 30% if you use the aerosol phase function. Did the same um, with the backscattering coefficients from the Calliope measurements, um, exactly the same picture over the North Atlantic region above um, North Africa, and looking at the mean over these two orbits, you again see better agreement of MERA data and a bit worse agreement of CRTM. These plots only show results for the constant aerosol ratio, not for the aerosol phase function. I did, just didn't have enough time to, to include these data. So what we learned from these comparisons is that there might be some issues in the CRTM aerosol table. Um, and that's why we were looking for an update of the aerosol table. And there was very recently, in I think it was July this year, a paper com came out from Josef Gasteiger um, and, and Wigner. Um, Josef Gasteiger is a postdoc who works at the University of Vienna. And I didn't know that he worked on this stuff. I knew him, but it, I didn't know that he works on this stuff. So I asked him if he could provide some information about aerosol optical properties. And that's what he did. So he provided information of his using his model of the hygroscopic growth of aerosols, mass extinction coefficient, single scattering albedo, and he also included in the data some information about the backscattering coefficient. To evaluate and compare his model to the CRTM model, we, he tried to do exactly the same what was done with, with CRTM before. So trying to redo everything using the same refractive indices, using the same 
um, mass and, and, and radii of the, of the aerosols. So just looking at the mass extinction coefficient of dust, for example, as a function of wavelength on the left side, as a function of radius on the right-hand side, you see very good agreement between the two models. So he, what he did was correct, obviously, which is good, except there's some points here. So the, the various, very smallest aerosol radio there seems to be an issue. And also at very high wavelengths, there is, there is something going on and there is a difference between MOPSMAP and, and aerosol uh, and, and, and CRTM in terms of dust. It's even more interesting to look at single scattering albedo because these lines are supposed to be at le exactly to be the same, which is obviously not the case. So there are differences. Um, Joseph's model only starts at a wavelength of 250 nanometers. Besides that, he used exactly the same wavelengths. He used exactly the same radii. But you see these differences in dust, assuming spherical particles, assuming the very same refractive indices, using exactly the same size of the aerosols. Um, and we think there might be some issues in the CRDM aerosol table. Um, last but not least, I told you that um, he also included this backscattering coefficient. And he, comparing his backscattering coefficient and our modeled aerosol exp, um, backscattering coefficient, which is obtained from the aerosol phase function times mass extinction coefficient times um, single scattering albedo divided by 4 pi, you clearly see differences in these, um, in these curves as well, which is closer to the truth. We do not know yet, but I hope to find out soon because this is one of the next steps we have. We would like to use and evaluate the MOPSMAP aerosol optical properties um, for further computations. We need to um, check the tangent linear and the joint models of the LIDAR AOP continue and finish work on the GSI. And finally, what was the goal of the Visiting Scientist Project actually is perform and evaluate assimilation experiments. So this is my very, very last slide. Um, there are so many people I'm really grateful to and a very, very, very special thanks to Ben and Marius who hosted me here in Boulder and also in, in College Park um, on the East Coast at NOAA. I'm grateful to Josef Gasteiger, who provided the MOPS map models. Uh, he already spent quite some time in helping me finding out reasons for differences. He provided the aerosol table, and we would like to use it. I'm grateful to Steve and Patrick, because without their input, I probably would still not know how to compute backscattering coefficients out of the aerosol table. I'm grateful to Matthias Lange, who helped me setting up everything on my computer. Of course, DTC, JCSDA, and NOAA, so who did all the administrative stuff behind, so getting some office space and doing travel arrangements and uh, all this stuff. And of course, data, concerning data, uh, NASA provided Mera, Aeronet, and Calypso data, yeah, and funding, of course, right? So the DTC Visiting Scientist Project paid, paid for my trips and the Horizon 2020 project paid my salary. So thanks a lot. Okay, we have two minutes for questions. <laughs> <coughs> questions? Well, it might be off topic, but uh, I'm, I'm interested in the LIDAR and just what kind of resolution they can get near the surface. You mean horizontal uh, vertical resolution? Vertical. Oh, sure, and at what horizontal resolution? I do not know the details. I know I own, so far I only used early net LIDAR measurements. Right. And they are completely different for every profile because every station provides a different kind of data. So sometimes it depends on how long, how many, how many individual shots they average and, and, tell, and, and provide as, a, as a, an extinction or backscattering profile. So sometimes they average over 
profiles from half an hour, what you clearly see in the vertical resolution of the mm -hmm. data, if they provide data every other minute or so, the horizontal, uh, the vertical resolution is of course much, much higher. So I do not know the intrinsic or vertical resolution of the data, but so that's so what I, I used so far. You're talking the space-based? Uh, this early net data is ground-based. Ground ground ah, and the space based. oh, phew, good question. I think maybe 60 meters or so, this is something. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just gonna say aerosols are one way to get after boundary layer depth, because mm -hmm. there's much different characteristics between the boundary layer and above the boundary layer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, just have to put in my interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But aerosols really play an important part to be able to identify that, so. And how high is the Calliope? The orbit? It, yeah. 700 and maybe 20 kilometers or so. Uh -huh. Some issues, maybe sometimes with stratospheric aerosols as well from cardio. I do not know if they remove. So we would use level two data for these comparisons. So they have to deal with this stratospheric influence as well. I think in general it's really small. Yeah. yeah. enough questions for you. <laughs> and Barbara will be here this week too, so please find her and send her email if you have questions. And let's thank, thank your presentations. Okay. <laughs>